Okay. So um, when you think about some of the, the impacts of weather, I'm an agricultural climatologist, and where this emerged in and this the story that we'll talk about today starts with this very basic factor that when you think about warming of the atmosphere, it's probably the simplest way to think about what's happening today. The Earth's atmosphere is a very, very large heat engine, and whenever you have the uh, bumping into air masses of warm and cold air, what's going to happen is a lot of work is going to get done. And I suspect most of you growers have seen some of this uh, currently in the recent, recent years, an increase in the variability, uh, rainfall, temperatures being rather different from historical norms. And then I would suggest to you that what's happening is becoming what's normal. In other words, the real impact of putting more energy into a gargantuan heat engine is that more work is going to get done. And the simple concept of tripling of the variance in the weather is a problem for agriculture as the hots get hotter, the colds get colder, uh, colder the dries get drier, and the wets get wetter. But where things get, the events that we hear about, I mean, the dramatic droughts, the dramatic floods, the rains, that's, that's one aspect of it. But probably more, hang on, let me not get there yet. I'm going to hold it for a second. Now, this is an example from uh, central part of the United States in Iowa. Iowa is considered one of the most um, stable environments for production of maize, maize and soybeans. And over 120 years of really pretty accurate rainfall data, what you're going to notice from this chart, this was produced by uh, Iowa Meteorology Department, what you're going to see here is literally the last five years all fell outside the 95th percentile. Now, this is... This is starting to speak now to the idea that our concept of historical norms probably needs to evolve because, of course, uh, the Earth's weather isn't constant. It is changing. But what's happening right now is, has some striking, cons uh, um, striking impacts on agriculture, and we're seeing that uh, ramifications of that all over the planet. So this is an example from, uh, from the United States. But more importantly than those dramatic events, like a huge rainfall, came out in an article in January of this year where the more insidious problems that are really occurring are warmer nights. Now, it turns out that I, I did a little bit of looking around into the historical Australia. I'll touch on that in a moment. But this may be something all of you are experiencing. Now, this creates enormous problems for agriculture. So I was in Uganda in the, in the fall. We, we've spent a lot of work and uh, a lot of time in Africa. And the common bean yield, this is just beans that are grown usually by the grower right there, uh, a couple acre farm for it, three, four acre farm. And they're going to eat these beans over the coming years. And they've seen a decline of about 30% in yield just due to the intensity of the foliar infections. And that is directly linked to warmer nights. Because what happens is, is that you don't cool off enough. You stay in the more optimal temperature and humidity for the proliferation of these various, uh, everything from fungal, bacterial, and viral diseases. Interestingly, I assume many of you enjoy a cup of coffee. Coffee is incredibly sensitive to nighttime temperatures being too warm. And we're seeing this in Central America. We're seeing it in Vietnam. We're seeing it in Indonesia or in fact the coffee crop is suffering tremendously. This creates actually even problems for human, um, human security, as they call it, because people begin to move around because they lose their jobs. There's a lot of effort going on today to try to figure out how exactly the impact of this can be somewhat uh, mitigated. And of course, it's, um, it's not an easy, it's not an easy uh, problem to deal with. Here in Australia, reading this just uh, straight away, you're seeing this uh, report describing the dramatic increase in the temperatures, particularly at night. Now, I'm assuming many of you have experienced this. And as you experience this, of course, what happens is your experience isn't what you're seeing. And that means that everything from the input providers, the, the crop protection providers, to even the processors are really functioning now in a sort of information void. And that's where really what, uh, what, our, what my business is and what we try to do. And we're doing this in, uh, with, with, through partners all over the world. We're providing very accurate localized weather data and trying to give a better sense of how to um, adapt to some of the challenges that are being faced today simply because of this weather variability. Now, I want to make it clear something that uh, many of you have probably encountered articles about climate change and climate change modeling in future states. I want to be pretty clear that those same articles, if you dig deep enough, will flat tell you that they cannot give you information at the spatial and temporal scale, scale appropriate for agriculture. In other words, they can't capture the very variability that impacts your production. And so it's a bit of a misnomer to be using a climate change model to try to give advice to a farmer. And I find it a bit 
amazing that there's such a huge amount of money being spent in something called climate smart agriculture when in fact the very models are saying that you can't do that. And it is an interesting challenge then to try to stitch together the practices that would help you optimize production and profitability in the face of increased weather variability. So our company has emerged, um, we're 40 people now, but we really started, I did my, uh, my postdoc uh, with the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center in Mexico and then went, on, went back to Kenya at the International Center for uh, Research in Agroforestry. And one of the characteristics of Africa, of course, is data scarcity. And it was these data scarce areas that led to the development of algorithms and so forth to really help us build the very asset that we have today, which is a global localized weather database current to yesterday and processing uh, and downscaling forecast data. Again, with the specific objective of trying to provide information to smallholder or to growers. What we call ourselves is in the business of agriculture intelligence. And the purpose for this is that big data, which is, it's kind of a, it's just, it's just a word, it's a set of words. It means a lot of things. But I guarantee you that when all of you are driving through traffic in big cities, you have reasons to pull your smartphones out, if I can get it out. And this tool right here is arguably the most influential piece of technology humans have ever created. It obviously is significantly more impactful than your microwave or than an airplane because billions of people get to use it. But it also connects every human who has one to the greatest libraries and the greatest minds on Earth. And that's what big data really is about. It's collapsing an enormous amount of information such that an individual at a specific location can receive the information in real time to give them a better mechanism to make a better decision. So for those of you who are driving through traffic, say in a large city, and you're able to see where the traffic is stuck, where there's been an accident, and avoid it, take a different route home, that's big data. And in a sense, in agriculture, the time is really due to be able to take advantage of some of these methods and analytics and technology. So it all starts, obviously, with ground station types of observations. I'm assuming many of you have a ground station like this. Now, there are problems with them, as you all are aware. One, you have to calibrate them. Uh, you also have problems often with microclimates. You have them in the wrong location. Or perhaps you have them in the right location, but the six-foot-tall tree that you planted some years ago is now a 25-foot-tall tree, and that influences things rather dramatically. I used to field check these when I worked in Africa, and it was comical the places I saw rain gauges. We also saw thermometers within, you know, three meters of an air conditioning output, which you can imagine they were rather warm. The point is you have ground station observations. You couple that in, in the middle picture of the map, we download about 12,000 ground stations globally every day. You couple that with uh, satellite imagery uh, processed. We have a, a, an agreement with the Cooperative Institute for Research in the Atmosphere at Colorado State University. They actually have a global hourly rainfall satellite derived set. It's about nine kilometer resolution. You couple that with ground stations, with models, with uh, really good interpolation routines, with the express purpose of taking a location that is not near an observation and being able to say rather precisely, hang on, ah, now it'll jump again, nope, there you go, rather precisely what the temperature and rainfall is at a location where you didn't necessarily have an observation. And you can actually do this rather accurately, and that's where things get rather interesting for big data. So if you take this idea that you can create a weather surface, that gridded net, if you will. Sorry, this clicker is, uh, there you go. Take satellite-derived rainfall data. This is global as well. And you're basically packaging it all together. And the, the purpose of this is to have a very consistent and current to yesterday and correct and comprehensive, meaning you have all the variables necessary for the various... Uh, models that might be driven everything from soil moisture status to plant growth and, and plant growth stage, things that agronomically give you insight into what you might do next. You package all that, that together. <coughs> you get something that looks like this, and it's global. Okay, it's a grid. It's, it's literally a virtual, if you will, weather station about every nine kilometers. For those of you who kind of deal with GIS, some of you may do. It's a five arc minutes, okay? The point is, is that we're dealing with space over Africa. We deal with, uh, with customers in the United States. We have customers in Europe, South America, Southeast Asia. And the purpose of this is because you can monitor what's going on everywhere in a continuous surface, thus you have a food security information system. And this is one of the places then that we intend to be taking. This is where we're taking our work. 
This map is just made a couple weeks ago. This just shows, and it's a heat map, it shows everywhere where data of ours has been pulled since January 1st. So these are people who are monitoring their fields, research scientists pulling data, et cetera. The point is we have some customers that range from you know, multinational to very small companies in Indonesia. Uh, you'll notice Australia, uh, the Middle East, and Central Asia are still blank. We're actually finishing the quality uh, control of those data sets, and they'll be coming online relatively soon. So when we talk about weather-based agronomics, it starts with very simple. I mean, the obvious one is you receive, I know all of you use weather forecasting, helps you literally decide what to do in what field. As you suppose you get a little more dramatic, a little more, mm, dramatic is the wrong word, a little more intensive, you may find that some of these models are giving you estimates of growth stage, giving you estimates of even harvest state. In some instances, for some crops, an agroeconomic model, we do this a lot in sub-Saharan Africa, to suggest to smallholder growers that the soil moisture status is great, it's been good so far, you're at flowering. For every dollar invested in fertilizer, you will probably get a 5x return in terms of increased productivity. I mean, very straightforward, very localized advice. And understand that because of this tool, a farmer can receive just a weather forecast and nothing else. But if they wanted to, a question could come to them and they could answer, I planted on this date this variety of maize. And then a model can track its growth stage, right? At that point, you're able to give even better information. So it becomes kind of a cycle. And that cycle is important because in that weather agronomics toolkit, there are a sort of a wide variety of things because very few things in agriculture are appropriate at all times of the season and in all geographies. So different uh, sort of pests and disease models, for example, are appropriate and important in certain areas and not in others. It's important to know when there's actual economic damage versus just um, like foliar infection coming later and there's no reason for you to do anything about it. It's, uh, it may color, discolor things, but it doesn't impact your profitability. When you get into irrigation scheduling, this is, becomes very specific to your soil type, so obviously more information becomes necessary. You can see where the big data piece is a cycle. Just as in using this for traffic, what they're actually tracking in some of those is the movement of your phone in your car. And therefore, when you slow down, they know the traffic has slowed down. In other words, there is a feedback going on. The more feedback, the more likely you get precise information. So as you think about all of the data that come together to help us work in some of these data-scarce areas, of course, in data-rich areas, you don't have those problems. In fact, in those areas, typically the problem is that the data are in different silos, and people tend to have a difficult time connecting it. And it is in that space where an underlying, very innovative database architecture surrounding location and time enables us to stitch data together that are otherwise rather difficult. So soils and weather and distance to market all have a location characteristic and therefore can be integrated. And in that lies an enormous capacity for increased efficiency and optimization. So when you think about big data, it typically has four characteristics. They can often break it out into a lot of sub ones. But in general, you start with description. All of you know an awful lot about what's going on in your locale. And some of that, unfortunately, as time changes and the environment switches, it can get a little more difficult to believe what's really happening. But sometimes some quantitative metrics can help you make decisions right or left side of the line, so to speak. And that's when you get into prediction. And prediction starts to play where the analytics are suggesting that a behavior of X will give you more productivity. And it isn't that it's perfect. In fact, in a casino, it's kind of an interesting place to bring up a story. If you were sitting at a table with eight people playing sort of Texas Hold'em, and you got to see two extra cards every hand, you wouldn't win every hand, but you would win. Because that little bit more information tilts you to the correct answer more often than not. And that fundamentally for agriculture is really where big data fits. When you get into prescription, this is where you're actually anticipating things. And I'm going to touch on that in a moment. And then, of course, automation. All of you are used to getting a alerts on your phone. I actually got one today. Um, our home in Denver, Colorado, a large storm came by and the tornado warning sirens went off. And uh, my wife sent me a note just saying, you know, <laughs> it's another one of these. We're getting very unusual weather in Colorado this year. It's, uh, it's the wettest spring ever. How's the pun? Mm -hmm. So these tools then enhance things like crop scouting. So these are the customers who typically take advantage of our data because it gives them a heads up what to look for and when to look for it. You have ideas here with some of our, uh, we have a couple of customers, commercial vegetable growers, one in Southern California has experienced tremendous temperature swings, things that they've never seen before. In fact, this year it was so warm in the winter 
Um, they have labor problems, uh, trying to bring people in typically from Mexico. There's visa regulations. They anticipated an April 9th, beginning of their harvest season, and by April 9th they were finished, and they had to plow under many acres. And this is a very bad thing for a business. But what I want to point out to you is that these crops, your crops, and this is, you know, we do this already with a couple of vegetable growers, one in Europe, there you go, and one in Southern California. Obviously, if you can track one field, right, if you can know when you planted this particular patch of broccoli and you've got 300 others where you have everything from celery to various lettuces, track them all simultaneously, you literally get visibility into which fields, which paddocks are behind and ahead of schedule. And that allows you to schedule all kinds of things, particularly in this case, in Southern California. It's a logistics. So this is an interesting chart. What you're looking at is this is an actual, uh, it was a, we've improved it since then, but it's a preliminary, it's a production. These are weeks down below. Uh, and the top one, well, let's talk about the lower one. I think uh, the light color was when they planned to harvest their broccoli. And the dark blue was when our system suggested that they needed to harvest it. And as you can see, their marketing schema pushed the amount of boxes of broccoli out to the point where they had sales and things committed. And of course, the weather said you better pick it a lot sooner. And they had way more acres to harvest than they had labor to harvest. And these are the sorts of insight, giving perspective, giving two and three week and four week and five week advance notice and how things are going that can bring value. So what we're talking about here is weather data that connects, you have your long-term climatology. That's your historical, so you know what used to happen. You have something about a 10-day forecast, which tend to get better and better. The first two or three days, much better than seven or days out, where your error starts to get rather large. And then you have this vague space in between where you have to connect the dots. Sorry, this is, uh, these builds do not work terribly. There you go. Where you can get into predictive models, where you're tucking the historical, the current, what's just recently happened this year with historical. You can even pull certain years out. And I know the Australian uh, uh, meteorology people um, have done that really well with the various signals from El Nino and so forth, but the idea is, is that you get a better idea of what's coming even outside the process models, with the whole point being you get better insight into managing your operation. And again, there's a feedback loop going on here. The more information that you provide, the more likely you get more information that's more specific to your location and your situation. Now, all of these data, from a pure business perspective, are available through what's called an API. All this does, it, it, man, it, it makes it so our clients, which are typically farmer-facing businesses or large growers themselves, can actually develop their own applications, pulling the weather data from our system. And what this enables people to do is a global footprint. So we literally have farmers in the island of Jamaica and in Indonesia and Sumatra, all over East and West Africa, and then we have large multinationals like Monsanto pulling the data that they need when they need it. And that's the idea of big data, is its accessibility is as important as its quality and its um, accuracy. Another way to look at that is that we're just one of the pools of data that's accessible. So more and more data from governments, from phones, surveys in the field, all of that information goes into a database. Basically, it's all accessible. It may not be in one location, but that's irrelevant. That's the whole point of the cloud. And what I like to say here is that the puzzle that is the complex system that is agriculture and that's the agricultural value chain from input to your buyers, from your markets in China to the markets local, to fresh, organic even, to very specific markets. What we do is just a piece of the puzzle, and I know it's a very complex system, and I will then tell you that some things I've been reading recently, uh, there's a book called Anti-Fragile by Talib. he speaks of this idea, the more complex a system is, the more you need very clear and current information to make sure that the system with a symmetrical is symmetrically managed, that input providers understand what inputs you need, anticipating what you're going to need so they have it in stock. Because it really doesn't do you any good to know you have a particular foliar outbreak if you have nothing you can do about it. And so um, I think that's uh, my story for today, is the idea that big data in agriculture, ag meteorology, can probably offer some value to some of you, some of your operations. And I would look, uh, look forward to uh, any questions you may have later. Thank you very much.